Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, April 11th, 2021, the second Sunday in Easter. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. I invite you uh, to uh, download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link uh, found in the description under this video on Facebook and on YouTube. You can also head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and look for the publications link, and then you can scroll down until you see today's date. Once you click on today's date, you can download the bulletin. You can feel free to print it out, or you can follow along on a uh, mobile device, a tablet, or a phone. Now that you have uh, the bulletin for today's service, uh, please uh, turn your attention to the announcements found on the last page of the bulletin. The session of CPC has decided to continue to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Keep in contact with us via social media with the username Central Press PB or at our website for announcements about any special services and when we plan to resume in-person worship. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, also centralpresspb.com. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord. Over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent theologies and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. If anyone sins, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven, and not, only our, not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. Let us confess our sins before God and one another, first in unison, using the prayer uh, printed in the bulletin, and then silently. O oh God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. We call ourselves children of light, but sometimes we act otherwise. We love ourselves more than others. We manipulate others to get our own way, and then pretend to be innocent. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Shine your light into our dark places, Bring the truth to our lips, and in your faithfulness, receive our confession and forgive us. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow, encouraged to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Unfortunately, this week, Rose von Tunglen was unable to provide us with a children's sermon, so now we will uh, turn everything to uh, Reverend Tim Reeves for this week's sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with verse 32 and proceeding through verse 35. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as, each, or as any had need. Our second reading comes from the first epistle of John, beginning with the first verse of chapter 1 and proceeding through the second verse of chapter 2. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, 
what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And finally, from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning with verse 19 and proceeding through verse 31. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put in, in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these signs are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. 
Ah, the good old days. Those days when everything seemed so much simpler, safer, and friendlier. At least, that's how we like to remember them. But if we are truly honest with ourselves, then those good old days weren't all that good as we remember them. If they had been, then there would not have been others longing for different good old days. It's just human nature that our present plights have a way of making us nostalgic for yesteryear. And so as we read the word from Acts this morning that the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned they held in common. And with great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and that great grace was upon everyone and that there was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need, we are tempted to say, ah, the good old days. Luke, in the book of Acts, further illustrates just how wonderful things were when in the following verses he tells about a Levite named Joseph who was also known as Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, who had a field that belonged to him and he sold it and he brought the proceeds of that sale and laid it or laid those proceeds at the apostles' feet. But immediately after that, we read about a husband and wife duo, named, uh, the man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who also sold a piece of property. But they withheld some of the proceeds from that sale, and as a result of lying about the price of sale, they were struck dead by Peter. Then in the sixth chapter of Acts, we read that the widows in the congregation were being neglected in the daily distribution of food, and that this necessitated the designation of seven people to fulfill this task, and so the office of deacon was created. Even later chapters of Acts report of disputes and divisions among the leaders of the church over whether and how to include Gentile converts. Paul and Barnabas will end up having to go their separate ways because Barnabas was willing to give John Mark, who had previously abandoned them on an earlier missionary trip, a second chance while Paul wanted absolutely nothing to do with John Mark ever again. No doubt there were moments and acts of great generosity and heroic compassion in the early days of the church, just as we find similar acts of generosity and compassion in every day and age of the church. No doubt there were also rather heartbreaking, gut-wrenching disputes in those days, just as we can find similar disputes in our own. And so, any true and honest assessment of the Church of Jesus Christ would have to say that far from being perfect, we are not perfect. As, or, or never as perfect as we profess, nor are we as beyond hope as we might appear. Which I think is one of the more enduring messages of our reading from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But 
If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are never as perfect as we profess or as beyond hope as we may appear, which I believe may very well be the overarching message of our readings from Scripture this morning. Let's turn to our gospel reading. As our gospel reading this morning opens, we encounter the disciples gathered in a rather familiar place, the upper room where they had gathered for their final supper with Jesus. And as our passage begins this morning, we are also clued into the fact that this was the evening of that first Easter. John reports in his gospel in verse 18 of this chapter that Mary Magdalene, after having encountered Jesus, had sought out the disciples and announced to them that she had seen the Lord. Death had not vanquished him. The grave could not hold him. Jesus was indeed alive. And we might expect that such good news would have led to uncontrollable rejoicing on the part of his disciples. But what John tells us is instead they were huddled together in a rather familiar place with the doors shut and locked because, John tells us, they were afraid. They were afraid of absolutely everything beyond those doors. Afraid of those who had conspired against Jesus to kill him. Afraid of all the uncertainty that was part of just daily life outside those doors. They were afraid of what the future might hold for them. They feared for their lives. They may have even been afraid to get on with their lives. And when you think about it, the disciples then were really not all that different from disciples of Jesus today. We seek sanctuary, a rest, a refuge from opposition, chaos, confusion, violence, destruction, despair, and the evil which compose so much of our daily lives. We find refuge among those whom we care about and who care about us and take a moment each week to kind of catch our collective breath and whisper words of comfort or reassurance or hope to one another. We gather to find that many of our brothers and sisters are nursing fresh wounds or bear emotional and physical scars because of our attempts to be faithful in an an often faithless world. And we have encountered, as a result, direct opposition from the prevailing culture. And we should not be surprised by this because Jesus himself warned his disciples that if the world hated him, it would certainly hate those who followed him. But knowing what to expect doesn't make the wounds hurt any less. Nor does it embolden us to enter the world. In fact, for many, it's just the opposite because If we know ahead of time that we can expect to encounter opposition simply because we confess our faith in Jesus Christ, then some people say, well, why bother? Why put myself through that? Why take a stand if in so doing we are placed at odds with friends or neighbors or even family? If doing what is right instead of what is easy comes at such a price, then why not just go along to get along? Why not stay behind our locked doors and play it safe? 
that seems like a sensible thing to do. But since when has our Lord Jesus Christ ever called any of us to do what was sensible? We are a people who proclaim a message of utter foolishness to those who do not believe. Paul called it a stumbling block to Jews and a scandal to Gentiles. Moreover, if our reading from 1 John is to be believed, then we proclaim such a message so that our joy may be made complete. And those words really struck me this past week because normally what we would expect John to have written is so that your joy may be complete. In other words, we are sharing the good news with you so that you too can experience that same joy that we have. And many a church evangelism program has been developed with that guiding premise in mind. Even some ancient manuscripts of this text from 1 John say your joy instead of our joy. But the oldest and most reliable manuscripts that we have say our joy. Which seems to imply that as long as there is even just one person in this world who is ever locked out, or looked over, or left behind, then we, the community of faith, cannot enjoy fullness of joy. We are diminished if we content ourselves with simply celebrating the good news with those of like mind and belief. Fullness of joy depends upon sharing the good news near and far. It is radically countercultural in its thinking and in its actions. Because our culture has a way of telling us that joy is to be found in what we can attain and accumulate. Joy, as the culture defines it, centers on self or hinges on self-centeredness. The gospel, however, tells us that joy and its deepest expression are found in focusing on the well-being of others and emptying ourselves for that very purpose. So let's go back to our reading from John. Yes, we learned that the disciples are locked away in relative safety, safety, but can any of us really call that living? Can you picture the scene? The disciples sitting there, wrapped in their own fears, behind locked doors. When suddenly, Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. Now, astute readers of John's gospel will remember that Part of Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples on the night that he would be arrested. Jesus said to his disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And then John tells us Jesus did something so typical of him. He revealed himself to his disciples. He showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And again, Jesus would say, peace be with you. And then to follow that gift of peace up, he gives his disciples gathered there that night a commission. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Well, why was Jesus sent? What purpose did our Heavenly Father have in mind? Well, obviously, in John's Gospel, that's very clear. The third chapter of John's Gospel tells us that 
God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus was not sent for his own well-being, but for ours. And in like manner, the church that bears his name is sent to continue the Lord's work. Not for our well-being, but for the world's. But we, of course, cannot die to redeem others from their sins, nor is Jesus asking us to do so. Jesus has already taken care of that. What we are called and commissioned to do is to bear witness to the grace and love of God in Jesus Christ and to live lives that are marked by forgiveness. As a community of people who are forgiven, we are, be, are to be about the business of embodying forgiveness and bearing witness to God's forgiveness. Robert Capon, in his book entitled Hunting the Divine Fox, an introduction to the language of theology, once remarked that the church is not in the morals business. Let me repeat that. The church is not in the morals business. The world is in the morals business, quite rightfully, and it has done a fine job of, all, of it, all things considered. The history of the world is, in fact, a monument to the labors of many philosophers and is a monument of striking unity and beauty when it comes to moral codes. C.S. Lewis once said that anyone who thinks that the moral codes of humankind are all different should be locked up in a library and forced to read three days' worth of them. He said you'd be bored silly by the sheer sameness of them all. But what the world cannot get right is forgiveness, which is what we in the church are here for. We in the church are placed in the world to deal with sin, which the world cannot turn off or escape from. We are not in the business of telling the world what's right and what's wrong so that it can then turn to good and avoid doing evil. We are in the business of offering up to a sinful and broken world which knows all about that tiresome subject, forgiveness for its chronic unwillingness to take its own advice. And the minute that we in the church even hint that morals and not forgiveness is what our mission and ministry is all about, we instantly corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ and run headlong into blatant nonsense. Because when we do that, we open the door to hypocrisy. And suddenly, the church, the gathered elect of God who recognize and thank God for the forgiveness we all share, suddenly becomes not misforgiven sinner, but misright. And Christianity gets boiled down to the good guys in here versus the bad guys out there. which of course is pure tripe because we are never as perfect as we profess or as beyond hope as we may appear. We all stand in need of forgiveness. We are all granted that forgiveness in Jesus Christ and it is incumbent upon the church that bears his name to share that message so that our joy may be complete. Because as long as one human being on this planet is still trapped in the notion that they are beyond hope and cannot be redeemed, then our joy can never be complete. How can we even think of rejoicing if anyone, anywhere, 
somehow believes that they are beyond God's reach or capacity to forgive. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. At this time, I ask that you will join with me as we affirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our tithes and offerings this week will be taken up again electronically. We invite you to head to the website, www.centralpresspb.com, and look for the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage. We accept debit and credit cards, and recurring donations can also be set up there. If you do not feel comfortable with tithing online, we do accept checks and those can be, uh, or money orders, and those can be mailed to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. Let us pray. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gifts of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life in your midst. And your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, call us, and equip us to share the good news of your redeeming love to all people. And so, O oh God, in our great gratitude, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, indeed our very selves, for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. As we turn to prayer requests and concerns, I would uh, ask that you can continue to keep Brad Von Tunglen in your prayers. He uh, continues to be in the ICU at uh, UAMS on a ventilator. Uh, he has shown some minor improvements over the last few days, but uh, uh, still stands in needs, uh, need of our prayers. Dominant Mong is recovering from his leg surgery and would appreciate our prayers as well. Uh, Jane Glover, a neighbor to Zach and Laura Cosner, has sustained a broken leg or a broken hip a few months ago, uh, uh, underwent quintuple bypass surgery recently. I ask that you continue to remember Pat Druitt's brother, Jim Monk, who is in the hospital right now with heart issues, and that you will keep the family of Clara Hammonds, Bubba Von Tunglen's step-grandmother in your prayers as uh, she passed away on Easter morning. With these people in mind and God's promise always to hear God's people, let us turn to God in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise that even before a request is on our lips, you know our deepest needs and most heartfelt longing. We give you thanks, O oh God, for 
the research that has led to the development of multiple COVID-19 vaccines, for the fact that so many people are now able to begin receiving that vaccine. And we pray that you will keep us ever vigilant until this pandemic is truly behind us. Give us the strength and the grace to continue to social distance. To care for ourselves and one another. Until nowhere do we see any more new cases of COVID. And certainly where no one else is dying as a result of this horrible disease. We give you thanks for the women and men in our health care facilities and across the nation who dedicate their lives and sacrifice much to care for those who are ill. Be a source of comfort and strength and peace for them. And help them know that even in their darkest days, they are performing a service the likes of which we can never truly thank them for the way they deserve. We pray, O oh God, for healing for Brad Von Tunglin and Dominic, for Jane Glover and Jim Monk. We pray for peace and comfort for all who mourn Clara Hammonds. In this season of resurrection, make us ever mindful of the hope that is ours, a hope of eternal life in your midst. And may that be a source of strength and comfort to us all. This we pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. Remembering that we are never as perfect as we profess, nor are we as beyond hope as we may appear. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.